Uh, the UK has agreed a £54 million deal with France to tackle the rising number of migrants crossing the Channel. Yes, meanwhile, the Nationality and Borders Bill passed its second reading in the Commons last night. It'll give Border Force offices power to turn back migrant boats attempting to cross the Channel from France and use uh, what it terms as reasonable force if mm. necessary. Well, Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy is here and you voted against that bill, didn't you? And you join us now. So what do you make of the large sum of money that the, the UK has now handed over and, in fact, these extra powers? Well, look, the, the Home Secretary did this last year. She handed over quite a large sum of money, not as large as, as this one, to France to try to disrupt the border crossings. And in the meantime, we've had a lot of hot air, a lot of rhetoric about all these grand schemes she's got for processing asylum seekers on offshore islands, about wave machines being put into the channel to try and deter people, but no actual real plans to deal with the crisis that we've got. She could do three things very quickly. She could hit the people smugglers who make money out of these crossings very hard. She could open up some safe routes for people to legally claim asylum. This government has closed down almost every safe route that there is. And she could also gri get a grip on the asylum system here. We've been pushing for legally binding targets so that we don't have this endless drift and delay where people are waiting years for an asylum claim to be processed. In that time, they often put down roots, they have families, and then it becomes much, much harder to have a proper asylum system where those who desperately need a safe haven here in the UK yeah. can find it and those who don't are removed quickly and humanely and we get on with our lives. I mean, and that is what Pretty Patel has just failed to do. The government will argue, of course, that they are doing everything they can to try and stop these people smugglers. They're the ones that they are trying to target in order to make this, this journey, this perilous journey that a lot of these, these desperate people are taking and the amount of money they have to pay to do it to make that unviable. They will say that they're closing these routes down and these options down to try and control the situation. Clearly, we can see from the numbers that have already uh, gone above the numbers from last year, it, it, it's not working. But, I mean, it, it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, as a country, the government are desperate for the French to try and stop these migrants coming into the Channel in the first place, and yet they're still able to do that. They All they come back and say, you've got to try and claim asylum in the first safe country you reach. But if, for these, these asylum seekers, they want to get to the UK. They're going to do everything they can to get here. Yeah, but don't forget as well that this is a problem that many countries across Europe are dealing with, is how you provide safe haven to those who need it and how you make sure that people aren't coming into the country and using the asylum system to get um, uh, status in that country by other routes. The UK is not alone in having to grapple with this problem. And the truth is the only way to disrupt those people smuggling gangs, they're international criminal networks is to work with other countries. And that's the problem with the Home Secretary's approach. She's very keen to throw money at France when she's got an immediate problem to deal with and some negative headlines, but she doesn't want to work with France and with other countries to disrupt these gangs when it would actually make a difference. We need an international agreement, we need an international approach to, to crime fighting and dealing with these people smuggling gangs. And actually that was the approach that Theresa May was trying to take when she was Home Secretary. She was trying to push forward measures that made it harder to smuggle people into the UK but looked after victims of trafficking. And this but government I has just torn that approach people, up. It's just back Lisa, to square one. I would one. argue that, that that didn't really work. And is there anything wrong with both? We have seen images and footage of what appears to be, you know, French border control almost ushering uh, vessels into British waters so that it's not their problem. So giving more power, use of drones, things like that, is that not a sensible belt and breaches approach? Well, it just isn't working. She did it last year and it made very little difference. I mean, you know, the, the government just keeps repeating the same things, the same tough talk, but very little in the way of practical action and the much, much more sensible approach would be to work collaboratively with other countries to deal, to get a shared approach to this issue, yeah. to make sure that we do look after people who need to be looked after. We do have a proud history in this country of looking after people who are fleeing persecution, but to make sure that for those who are trying to use the asylum system to circumvent other routes, that we have an approach that says that you do claim asylum in the first safe country that you go to, that you are processed there, and that m more importantly, that we invest in countries where people are fleeing to make sure that people don't have to leave in the first place.
There are uh, clearly sort of, uh, if you'd have watched the, and I'm sure you did, the Dominic Cummings interview yesterday, the disarray that you're talking about, the fact that a lot of this policy isn't working and they're just throwing money at it. Dominic Cummings was sort of unequivocal in the fact that he was pointing to Boris Johnson not being up to being Prime Minister. He had no plan. They were trying to oust him not long after he'd got in there. I wonder what you made of that interview. And equally, from a politician's perspective yourself, you're the Shadow Foreign Secretary, you have, you have advisers around you. The idea that a close advisor could suddenly turn on you and start sharing some very intimate, very personal, very private conversations as well. Well, I mean, I think Dominic Cummings came across appallingly from that interview. He seems incredibly narcissistic. He was at times arguing that it was perfectly appropriate for somebody who's unelected and unaccountable to seek to bend government to their own ends. He was talking about replacing the Prime Minister. He was talking about the decisions that he was able to make at the heart of government. I think the question for Boris Johnson isn't, is Dominic Cummings telling the truth? I think the real question is... How on earth did you come to appoint a man of this moral character to the heart of Downing Street and allow him free reign to make these sorts of decisions, life and death decisions during a pandemic? I mean, that doesn't reflect well on the Prime Minister or his judgment if he allowed somebody of this moral character to get to the heart of government and make decisions that affect all of our lives. Mind you, um, it does also beg the question, why isn't Labour doing better in the polls if the government is in such huge disarray and their judgment is so bad to invite someone like that in? Well, I do think people will be worried about the testimony that Dominic Cummings gave yesterday, not because anyone's got sympathy for Dominic Cummings, but because it does raise serious questions about the Prime Minister's judgment. But I also think we're in a situation where people want their governments to succeed. You can see that in Scotland with the SNP, you can see it in Wales with Labour, you can see it in uh, Westminster with the UK government. And, you know, people make no apology for that. They want us to come through this pandemic, which means that they want the government to make the right decisions. And we will carry on doing what we have been doing, which is pushing them very hard to make the right decisions, opposing and challenging them where they get it wrong, but also making constructive suggestions for how they get it right. The country has got to get through this and we are the official opposition. That is our job. Um, I know that we're supposed to let you go. Apologies, because we're stealing a little bit of your time. But you also uh, wanted to talk about this Russia report. The government was forced to publish this Russia report about interference into, into UK affairs. Uh, I think there were 21 recommendations uh, to be implemented. It's a year since the report was published, and not one of those recommendations has been put into place. Yeah, it's been the most appalling shambles from the government that over the last 12 months they, they kicked kicked up a fuss about publishing this in the first place and it laid bare the extent of foreign interference in Britain the dark money that runs right through the city of London that sustains authoritarian regimes but enables foreign governments and state backed actors to interfere in British democracy. The government said it would take it seriously, it said it would implement the report it hasn't implemented a single one of those recommendations. This is about defending British democracy from attack and as we've seen in the last few days the revelations that have emerged about the attack by Chinese government-backed actors that hacked into servers across the United Kingdom, trying to steal people's personal data, costing businesses millions of pounds. This is something the government now needs to take seriously. National security and our democratic freedoms cannot be up for sale to the highest bidder. The that, government needs to clean up its acts. I'd imagine that they would argue that there's sort of more pressing issues right now. Well, that's, that, would be, that would be a legitimate thing to argue if national security wasn't at stake and if the government hadn't found time during the last 12 months to make it harder for UK citizens to vote by passing voter suppression measures through the House of Commons. We want them to make it harder for foreign uh, uh, actors to interfere in British elections, not make it harder for UK citizens to exercise their democratic rights and freedoms. In the time that Boris Johnson's been Prime Minister, he's taken huge sums of money from figures linked to some of those authoritarian regimes for the Tory party. It, enough is enough. The Russia report made clear that that was part of the dark web of money that has to be disrupted. Instead of going off fundraising for the Conservative Party and making it harder for UK citizens to vote, it's about time he stood up for people in this country and implemented that report. Good to talk to you, Lisa Nandy, this morning. And uh, you've learned something about ducks, too. It's, uh, <laughs> I it's can guarantee you, whatever happens today, you are going to remember you're that. Gonna rem you're going to quote it for the rest of my life. <laughs>
<laughs> Usually you're dealing with different sorts of bills on your day-to-day -day yeah, business. Quite, you... quite. Oh, no, no groans. Oh, no groans. He's here all week. Lisa and Andy, thank you. Um, lovely.